So, um, hello. <laughs> My name is Terrell Hansen, and um, I am uh, really honored to be here amongst uh, you all today. I really would like to kind of take the opportunity to just kind of uh, let you know that I'm here as much to learn from you as hopefully you are to learn from me. Um, I think that the, there is a plethora of uh, great knowledge in this room that I'm excited to hear a little bit more about what you're doing and how this connects to some of the, um, the things that you've seen. I'm looking, um, just serving the uh, age group and the um, uh, kind of the people in the room here right now, I'm willing to bet that nothing that you're going to see over the next 30 minutes is going to be mind-blowing, out-of-the-box kind of things that you've probably seen and experienced on uh, on the internet or through YouTube or through your experiences uh, with, uh, with graphic design. So um, I'm really just kind of here to tell you my story and about a little bit about how uh, I came to develop what I call Frame the Message, Inc. So um, to start us off, I just want to say hi, my name is Terrell, and I was that child in school. I was that kid who literally had to draw. I don't say I wanted to draw. I wasn't that kid who just loved to draw. I was the kid who needed to draw. I needed to draw in order to make connections. I needed to draw in order to hold on to all of the information that I felt was coming at me quickly. I needed to draw in order to hold on to information if I had any hope of being successful in school. My parents were both educators. Uh, my mother was a third grade teacher who retired from the same classroom after 35 years in the same classroom in Washington School District here in Arizona. My father retired and they named the gymnasium after him. He taught PE, boys PE, seventh and eighth grade. And they were absolutely pillars of the institution of education. So you would think that their offspring, their one and only offspring, would be good in school. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't only not good in school, but I also had a way and a style of learning that my teachers didn't understand back in the days that I was in school. And so what I found myself doing as a child is hiding anything that I was drawing rather than bringing out as a source of pride. Because I always thought that it was kind of a sign of compensation for lack of knowing rather than an enhancement of my knowing. Well, fast forward 40 plus years later, and that's really not the case in schools anymore. There's lots of different ways of looking divergently at the way that people learn, not just children, but also adults. And we're, built, we're more willing these days to bring out kind of this element of visual art in order to enhance a message rather than distract from it. So as a child, I learned much like everyone else did, I started like this. I started with stick figures. Yes, my stick figures look like nobody else's stick stick, or like everybody else's stick figures. They had the enlarged heads and the enlarged ears and the scraggly hair. They had kind of incongruent limbs. They were nothing special, I guarantee. Because we all start out like this. It was long before this. I'm not even I'm not even that old, and I'm old enough to remember the scratch on letters before we actually had a computer. I took my entire wedding invitation. And I use those little rub off, you know what I'm talking about? Do they still exist with the little popsicle stick that you rub off the letters? I still remember the label maker that had the kind of, um, uh, uh, were, it was blue tape and it had kind of the um, uh, raised letters. Do you remember those things? It had a dial. I should have shown a picture of that one because you're all like, nope, don't remember no, that I'm one. I'm the only one that probably remembers. <laughs> I remember the font machines that only had two, or the label makers that only had two sizes but no font selections. I remember the computer paper that had holes down the side that you had to, I remember typewriters. But I also am from a generation now that I recognize that it wasn't just my lack of having these things. It was the sense that visual images didn't capture messages then the way that they tend to do now. So I used mostly this. I had no training. I had no ability to really draw or shade. All I know is that my mother, being a third grade teacher, had lots of these nicely sharpened with really pristine erasers. So I used my pencils a lot to draw. And I also found that I could use my pencil in the margins of my note taking, you know, the outline that my teachers were making me keep. I could live my life in the margins. And I could draw my pictures without being seen as being distracted from, from, the, um, from what I was learning. So I could hide it well when I was using my pencil. Then I developed a love for this. Now I really should have a Sharpie marker up here because when I, when I developed my love for the Sharpie marker, I developed a love for note taking again. I 
hated outlines. I hated linear approach to just about anything. I didn't like lists. I never kept lists. I drew pictures. I drew arrows. I drew charts. I drew anything that helped me to make connections in new and different ways. So basically, all through school, mostly what I learned was this. Now you're asking, wait a minute, a minute ago you said you didn't do well in school. So what's with the A plus? I found that all through school, I could do a pretty lousy job on an essay, but if I did the extra credit and I did the visual that went along with it, these are the grades that I got. I literally have papers that say content weak, structure poor, off topic, audio, extra credit audio visual, A plus. That's how I got through school. I found that here again, my compensation kind of reared its ugly head, but at the same time, it helped me get through school. How is it that I became a teacher? That's why. I became an, a teacher because I found that there had to be more kids out there like me that just demonstrated their knowledge differently. It may have not been in a written form, but if it was written or if it was, it was expressed in a way that helped my teachers to see that somehow they believed that I understood the content, otherwise I wouldn't have gotten an A plus, then perhaps there are other children out there like that as well. So I became a teacher, just like my mother and father. And it was probably my third and fourth graders that taught me this. You know, children are the best at throwing away paper. If you've ever worked with children, they'll try to draw something, they'll hate it, they'll crumple it up, they'll throw it away. No matter how many times you tell them how many trees they're killing in the process, they just simply want to start over. They're never happy with what they draw. So when one of my students told me, well, Ms. Hargens, you know, I was Ms. Hargens back then, mistakes are only opportunities. And I said, well, who taught you that? And they said, you did. Because what I did was modeled in my classroom that it wasn't just about putting on the pretty pictures, but it was like I was willing to go to the board and scribble something out. Even though they had seen my life-size Minutemen and my three-dimensional habitats, they weren't intimidated by that when I was willing to go to the board and scratch something out to portray a message. And when I made a mistake, I didn't start over and say, oh, that doesn't look very good, let me start over again. I would continue to draw and always say, somehow, not even knowing I was saying it, mistakes are only opportunities. When I draw on the board and when I draw in my notebooks, it's very different than the drawing that I'm about to show you now. But it's evolved over time. Because what I've learned after uh, about 18 years in the classroom, I got the opportunity to uh, come to the work of the Arizona K-12 Center. Now this just happens to be um, a center that I have a great love and joy for, as does your uh, teacher here. Uh, the executive director uh, is your teacher's sister, so that's how we got to know one another. Um, but when I came to work at the center, this is where my evolution really began, with really be better understanding how visuals can make the link between a lack of, un of understanding, between a lack of vision, between um, the inability to see connections in an informational, dense world, <laughs> Because what happened at the Arizona K-12 Center my very first year is I was learning to, um, I was very much out of my box because now for the first time in my life I had been taken out of the classroom and now I was being asked to uh, speak on behalf of programs and grants and opportunities that were very much outside of my comfort zone. And I was used to in my classroom being able to create visuals when I needed to convey a message, but when I came to the center I wasn't sure that there was a place for that. because. Really, everything that the Arizona K-12 Center has ever done has been pristine. It's been done digitally, it's been done with the help of web developers, it's been done with the help of Photoshop and Illustrator and all of those wonderful tools that I just didn't really have an understanding or a working knowledge of. So when I was trying to learn how to spread the message of a particular program, I did what I always do. I grabbed my trusty Sharpie marker, I grabbed my composition book, and I started drawing out because I needed to believe in what I was about to, to display to others. So when I uh, did so, I came into, was called into my boss's office, and she wanted to know if I put any thought into my presentation and how I was going to share something called the Master Teacher Program. And I said, yes, I put a little bit of thought into it, and she said, well, tell me a little bit about it. And I found myself absolutely tongue-tied. 
I could not figure out a way how to express to her what I was going to present about this master teacher program and I and it without showing her my drawings, but I was absolutely petrified to show her my drawings. Any guesses why? I spent my whole life hiding that, hadn't I? <laughs> my whole life hiding that. The minute I brought that drawing out as archaic and as messy and as sloppy as it was, I was afraid it would be a lack of intelligence rather than to enhance the message. And so with the persuading of my colleague sitting next to me, she's like, just get out your drawing and show her. And so I pulled it out and I showed her. And then suddenly my verbal acuity kicked in. <laughs> I could talk about my message when I had my pictures to help walk me through it. I thought she'd say, oh, <laughs> very nice but you're not going to do that for the presentation, are you? But instead, she said, can you draw it bigger? And I said, of course I can draw it bigger. I would love to draw it bigger, but are you sure this is the kind of artwork that you want other people to see when we're trying to put our best foot forward for this program? And she said, absolutely. And so this was the first drawing that I ever did. This was now almost 10 years ago. And I drew it on large butcher paper that ended up spanning with a very small office space. And so in order to even post it for her to see it, it literally wrapped around the room. And so when she came into the room to see it and she saw it kind of as big and enlarged in life, and she heard me talk through the master teacher program and the purpose and the vision and the promise that it had, I think she was hooked from that moment. And I don't think she was hooked just because it was pretty to look at and novel. I think she was hooked because she saw connections. And she saw the ability for others to see connections in something that might be abstract. So this is how my evolution began. I started realizing that there were a lot of other people out here doing the same kind of thing. They called it graphic recording. So I started to realize that the more I watched other people do this work, I found it really wasn't about the pictures as much as the concepts. It didn't really matter what the pictures were. It was about the connections and the concepts as they were making it. So from that point on, I started to listen and learn differently. Imagine, I'm a grown adult by the time I finally figure out how I learn best and how many others learn best. I started to listen differently. I started to read differently. I was never a great reader. My mother was a reading teacher, yet I never really developed a love for reading because it felt like so much information and I couldn't hold on to it all. So I learned to listen differently. I learned to look for concepts. I looked for learn to learn to look for themes. I learned to look for words that would stand out and think about how would I summarize this for someone else and what would I pull out of this piece in order to um, communicate a message. I also learned to learn differently. These are drawings that I did as I was learning a new concept called cognitive coaching. And I found out that there was a kinesthetic element to drawing as well. When I learned this is a map that has to do with a planning conversation that you would have in a coaching conversation. And what I learned is when I was drawing these pictures, it was solidifying the idea in my mind. And when I was having a coaching conversation, I wasn't only visualizing that picture, I was walking myself through that picture. I was standing at the goalpost, thinking about what questions I would ask to clarify goals. I was walking along that path and I was walking up those steps and I was standing at the top of them. And they helped me to hold on to concepts so that I could free myself up to listen more intently in the, co in the coaching conversation. So I learned differently and I started realizing that graphics can help other people learn differently. I also, um, you know, I mentioned that I wasn't very good in school, but somehow I found my way to a doctoral program about five years ago. I uh, graduated with a doctorate in teacher leadership and uh, innovation. And this just happens to be a drawing that I pulled out when we were asked to have six people summarize our entire dissertations and find common things, themes among our interventions. So I found that it was a way of connecting people as well. How do we look at all of this information and really just put it in a nutshell? So obviously, graphics have found their way into the world where now even doctoral programs are starting to see that as a way of presenting research and making it accessible. So as I mentioned, I'd seen it done before and I set out to do something similar for the K-12 Center. I decided that what, I could, what they could do, I could do as well. And so at the very first moment, now remember, I was hiding my drawings under my desk. I could barely present it to my executive director without fear of judgment. And now I'm gonna take it larger than life and I'm gonna take it to uh, professional development, which is what our center provides. And I'm gonna put it 
um, three by five panels, and I'm gonna stretch it across the room, and while people are speaking, I'm gonna draw in public while they're speaking. That means I've got to draw in public, bring out everything that's vulnerable about me. I've got to be able to listen differently so that I can keep up with what they're saying. I have to listen for themes because I can't include it all. And I have to hope that other people in the room are gonna connect with it, and it's gonna be a source of communication and not a distraction. So I learned really quickly that that's not easy to do, and it was hard. But the hardest part wasn't in doing it, because I'd been doing it all my life. The hardest part is was allowing other people to view it as a, as a message and not as a distraction. So people ask me all the time, how do you do that? How do you listen and get just the main themes? I learned that these are the things that I have to do. First, I have to relax. I have to simply breathe. I have to realize that my inner scrutiny is way harder than anybody else's scrutiny. I see my mistakes, but my third and fourth graders never did. So I have to breathe and believe that other people don't see them as well. I also have to listen differently. I have to get that inner voice out of my head that says my whole inner critic is talking to me so loudly that I can't hear what other people are saying. So I had to get rid of the inner critic I had to breathe and realize that other people are not scrutinizing it nearly like I am. I had to listen for themes and connections, not listen for every single detail, because that's where we are. We're in an information-dense society. It's going to come at us faster than we can possibly keep up. So I had to listen for what, were the, what was the essence of those themes. I had to not be afraid to ask questions. And, not, and I had to be afraid not, uh, not be afraid to allow people to say, hey, is this what you're hearing? What else are you hearing? And involve other people in the drawing. So that it wasn't just my ideas on the paper, but it was a collective. And I had to recognize that opportunities, they're opportunities and not mistakes. There's no mistake that I can make, even when it's larger than life, that can't be fixed with a little sticky label and a pair of scissors. You know those name tags are everywhere in professional development. You grab one of those, you cut it out, you plop it on and you draw right over it and nobody ever sees it. I also had to realize that there are ways to connect ideas, that this wasn't just about splattering all the information, because if I just take all the information that's already dense and I slap it up on a, on a canvas, then I'm doing nothing other than just a visual agenda. I'm just putting it in a picture. But when I listen for connections, and I can look for stories. I use a lot of rivers, I use a lot of bridges, I use a lot of roads, I use a lot of trees, because I find those just apply to just about everything, metaphorically. But I'm also really looking to try to stretch myself outside of what's kind of considered cliche and start to think about new images that will stretch people's thinking. I learned that um, primarily from what I've heard people saying about it. People were saying to me, Terrell, you know, this isn't, this is really beautiful, but at the same time, it really is bringing light to this concept. And new conversations were had around that concept opens new doors, helps me learn. But my favorite story is the story of a woman who came to me and said, now you know they say that about 80, 85% of the public is actually, they are actually visual learners. How many of you would see yourself as a visual learner primarily? That's your preferred way of thinking. Surprise in this class, right? How many of you would call yourself primarily auditory learners? So you see there's usually fewer of those. And how about kinesthetic, which is kind of the movement action type of learner? There's a lot of research to support that majority of people are visual learners. But one day, I was drawing um, uh, for a convention, and a woman came to me and she said, you know, Terrell, when you first set up in the front of the room, I thought to myself, this is going to be hugely distracting, because I am trying to listen to a keynote speaker and watch you at the same time, and I am not a visual learner. So I thought for sure that I was going to be so tremendously distracted that I wouldn't be able to keep up with what was being said. And she said, but over time, I started watching you kind of draw, because I'm very much a kinesthetic learner. A lot of people think I'm visual, but I'm much more kinesthetic, I think. Because what I'll do is I'll sometimes move across the canvas, and then something won't connect for me yet, so I'll move on, and then I'll come back to it when it connects to something that's been said maybe 15 minutes later. The woman said to me, I started watching you draw, and you left this part of the canvas blank. And I started thinking to myself, Oh my goodness, that's a pretty abstract concept. It was like a concept like um, uh, uh, self-actualization. And she started thinking, oh my gosh, she doesn't know what to draw. She said, I started thinking about what I would draw. And then you went on and you came back and you drew something different than what I would draw. 
And then I started comparing and contrasting what you drew with what I drew. And this was 15 minutes earlier in the, in the keynote speech. So then I started connecting it to all of the other drawings you've done up to the point we were at. And she said, Terrell, I would have never done that if I had just relied on my outline and my notes. I would have never gone back and made those new connections. That story reminds me of how important visuals can be for people to stretch them outside of what they might typically be used to doing and learning. Think about it. If you've ever had a really, really abstract concept that you've had to share with someone and they don't understand it, you've probably all been in that situation. I'm explaining it as many different ways as I know how and they just don't seem to be getting it. What's the first thing you do? You grab a piece of paper and whether it's just X's or lines or arrows, you draw it on a notepad so that you find a new way for people to try to connect with what you're saying. It's the way that humans are wired. Humans are wired to do these kinds of things. And so it's not only about should I use visuals, but when I use visuals. It's really all about the message. It doesn't matter. Does this all send the same message? Everything, it doesn't matter about what type of drawer, how, what kind of artist you are. I have never had an art class other than up through fifth grade when we we're all required to have it. And even that's going away with education funding. <laughs> A lot of people don't have art classes but can still use visuals to communicate a message. So um, my, as my evolution kind of moved on, I started to, um, as I mentioned, I'm a, a full-time employee at the Arizona K-12 Center currently. I'm investigating and kind of exploring this idea of creating an LLC called Frame the Message Inc. as I found it so powerful and so rich for so many environments from education to philanthropic organizations. I even uh, draw sermons at church um, yes, I've drawn on a series on sex, love, and dating. I've drawn on a series on re uh, Revelation and the Apocalypse. <laughs> um, I've drawn on the holiday hangover, you know, how to keep yourself out of the mess during the holidays and keep focused. All of these kinds of things started to help me see that there are multiple opportunities to do this kind of work. And so I had a friend who came to me and said, I'm trying to learn to be a web developer and I need a project. And your project would be perfect. Can I create a website for you? And so, of course, I thought, oh yeah, that'd be fine. It'd be a place for me to kind of put all these pictures. What I didn't know was that I was going to have to go through a, a kind of a self-discovery process when I did. How many of you have a website of your own that you manage or have had to develop? A couple of you. It's like, it's a growth process, isn't it? You have to learn about who you are when you start this, okay, all about Terrell. What do you want people to know about Terrell? What do you do? Why is it important? Why does it matter? Why should they choose you? You know, all those questions that all I thought was I was creating something where I could put pictures up. Now I have to really start thinking about what it is that I do. I started gathering quotes from people and they were so telling. They started to really help me to see that there was a purpose and a behind my passion. This one happens uh, to be a strategic planning out in Arkansas. I was commissioned to go out there and take their strategic plan because they had a new superintendent coming in and the superintendent wanted to um, have this kind of vision really clear. He didn't want to feel like he was coming into the school and telling them what to do. He wanted to hear what their vision was. And so I spent two days just drawing everything I heard. This now hangs in their boardroom so that they can remember what's important. Every time they buy a book, a textbook, every time they choose an assessment, every time they hire, they use this as, okay, but does it fit with the vision that we said is important? Is our action plan, I left this purposely blank for them, is our action plan aligned to what we said was important? These were two storyboards that were several days long. Um, this one happens to be around, um, uh, kind of, it has more of a storyline. It has um, kind of this path that breaks off and the skateboarder who kind of ends up off the path but then back on the path and then the path permeates itself through a wave with a surfboard. So it's this idea of how do we have this path of distraction that gets in the way of free, free thinking. So this one's much more of a metaphor um, story. You know, they're hard to see but. And so as I developed my website, I had to think about how would I describe why this is important. So this is what I came up with. I'm still, you know, as you know, when you have a website, you change your mind every time you read it. You're like, yeah, that's so yesterday. I've got to write something different. But right now, this is where I've landed. This is why I think the power of graphics and graphic recording is so important.
It's about taking the learning experience from the now to what happens afterwards. What's still lingering in your memory of a three-day conference that is still here and still uh, reminds of, uh, of, of what we've learned. So most of what I do is graphic recording. This is um, how it looks. You set up on a, a couple of easels and with some foam core, so that gives me a hard background. I wrap butcher paper or um, art paper around it. Uh, sometimes they go anywhere from a five, three to five foot panel all the way up to a 10 or 15 foot um, piece, depending on how long it is. This one happens to be with the author or the keynote that I was working for at that moment. Um, sometimes I just capture an hour conversation. This happened to oops, that one happened to be uh, a one hour lunch conversation. So literally they were having lunch and they wanted me to draw their conversations. <laughs> so this was all around building healthy communities and what needed to be involved in building healthy communities. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, this one happened to be, sometimes what I'll do is think about kind of the concept first. It should be coming in soon. It's a big file. Um, I'll think about kind of the concept first and the design of it first, and then try to capture it based on the storyline. Strategic planning. This one happened to be around some really, really abstract concepts like uh, fingerprinting and uh, altered bodies and new ways of thinking. This was a forecast for the future. And what they wanted is they wanted the people in the room to be able to dream big. And you know, you say to people, dream big, anything you want. What, what would you think? You know that most people don't do that, right? They, they only brainstorm things that are possible. They hardly ever brainstorm things they think are impossible, right? We stick ourselves. We, we say, we have no idea uh, what that would look like or sound like, so that can't be a possibility. Leave that off the brainstorm table. <coughs> when you want people to brainstorm and really think out of the box, like these folks were doing, I was taking the, each of these big ideas that came from a forecast of the future, and I was drawing what they thought could be possible, and it actually expanded their brainstorm more when they could see something kind of concrete that represented an abstract concept. So in helping with brainstorming, this one happened to be around economic development. So I had a whole bunch of keynote speakers that were showing spreadsheets, uh, yeah, spreadsheets that you can't see, um, tons of text. They were uh, economic developers, uh, political analysts. They were speaking a language that was way up here. Guess who the audience was? Teachers. So teachers were sitting there trying to connect with all of these spreadsheets. And so I was off to the side drawing metaphors to represent the idea of loopholes and leaky boats and how we can utilize those funding streams in ways that inspire. I also do living timelines. Where do people fit in to, their, um, to the development? This happened to be a 25 year timeline. So as they shared the 25 years of their organization, each of the audience members had leaves um, and birds and they could write on when they came into the picture and then they were able to put it on the living timeline. This is another timeline. Humans are wired to connect. They wanna see themselves in the visual. They don't wanna just see a visual. They wanna see them, their ideas, their concepts. They wanna see themselves in it. So in this particular exercise, it was a vision that was laid out by a grant and then the teachers were coming in and putting themselves, here are the goals that I have for myself as a teacher, and here are possible places within that learning plan that I can see myself fitting. This is another timeline that basically just takes for all the way from 2010 to our upcoming um, future, and then takes big ideas. So this year we were learning about how to know what it meant to be a teacher leader. Here's how we started thinking about teacher leadership differently. This year we started to learn how to write to advocate for ourselves as teacher leaders. Here's where we started to band together and begin to lead as teacher leaders. Here's where we gathered together and mobilized our forces to make a difference. This year we're learning to model what it looks like in classrooms. Next year we're gonna mobilize ourselves and really reach some high and worthwhile goals as we put our boots to the ground and do the work. So it's an idea of a timeline that kind of consolidates big ideas. Special tributes for people. This one happens to be my daughter who graduated from ASU uh, this year, and so these were ideas that she had for uh, a graduation announcement. Um, big ideas around data protocols were, I spent three or four years trying to help people understand why data protocols were so important and they weren't just something they had to submit because they had to. 
This was a, a picture that I literally pulled out and drew just to help people to see how all of the data protocols fit together. This is a mission statement by a superintendent who I think the powerful story here is that he had been um, inspired. He was a Navy SEAL himself who had come to become a teacher. And he was in a district that was struggling, you know, struggling because teachers were seeing themselves as being defeated and that nothing that they could do could really make a difference in this, in this particular school. And he had seen a commencement speech at the University of Texas called, if you want to change the world, here are 10 lessons. And he felt it was so inspiring for his teachers that he showed it to them. And of course, they were all uber inspired. You've watched inspirational videos, right? And then you're so inspired, but then two days later, the inspiration is lost. He wanted there to be some level of stickiness to that inspirational video. So he hired me to write out the 10 lessons or draw out the 10 lessons so that he could have that to remind people on a day-to-day -day basis that if we really want to change the world, which is what teachers do, we have to be willing to stick it out. Stick it out through the hard times, persevere. We have to be able to have the heart of a Navy SEAL when it comes to walking into classrooms where uh, populations are becoming more and more challenging to teach. Sketch noting, if you've seen that, some of you um, might even actually do this. Ways in which you use your notebook to capture ideas. Uh, there's a really big following of sketchnoting. If you want to follow on Twitter, uh, Sketchnote Army. Um, it's a great um, little follow because people all around the country are submitting their sketch notes for some really great concepts. So that's another aspect. And then there is a video. So I'm just going to show you little pieces of these videos rather than the whole thing. But I'll let you know that you can find these on my website under videos. There are three of them. Um, I have. I was shared with somebody in here, I was just shared recently by Susan, your, um, uh, a PowerPoint video that you did with transitions, with your graphics. That's exactly what I, I have no working knowledge of Photoshop and Photo Illustrator. I, I know enough to be dangerous and enough to know that I need to get the Adobe Creative Cloud so that I can start learning. I know enough about uh, how to use YouTube to find out how to make these things and do these things, but I am on a huge learning curve when it comes to really utilizing the technology to my advantage. So what I'm stuck doing is doing what teachers know best. Teachers know Keynote, teachers know PowerPoint, teachers know how to put together transitions. This one happens to be a book release. I just asked the author to go ahead and record her voice on her computer so it's a little quiet um, right as now, I'm learning. bunk science for the most part because of lots of different factors. What she wanted to do is she realized that most of her research she was sharing with an audience that are that, that new research. Thought that wasn't the audience she wanted to reach. She wanted to reach the audience of the people that are in schools making decisions about how to evaluate teachers. So she wanted something really simple and easy to use. Rather than putting up spreadsheets and research, she wanted to make the content accessible. So all this is, is working on my tablet, is uh, just basic images that are using transitions. So like you're used to these kinds of things. You can make the coin spin or you can make things move in. All of those transitions are easy to use and a way that you can bring graphic animation to life. The other problem with graphic animation for education specifically is that it's hugely expensive. Hugely expensive. And most education, um, or well, if we know much about education, we know that there's not a lot of money in education, especially to do things like this. So this is a low cost, uh, really effective way to bring images to help um, uh, portray a message and make it more accessible to audiences. So that's Van. 
The other one is, um, this one happens to be some album art. Teachers are famous for having more than one job. I don't think I've ever met a teacher that didn't have something going on the side to supplement their income. This happened to be a teacher who uh, was um, a musician. Uh, he has a little band called the Urban Hillbilly Quartet, and he wanted to have one of those um, um, YouTube videos where the words were. Happens to be to a William Blake poem. This is the album art that I just kind of cut apart to create this video. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Committed educators take this daily and the profession regarded, but not often recognized, teaching. Together, we represent diverse contexts and communities, but unite around a set of common beliefs to ignite the fire of learning for all students. Step one of a thousand miles for the journey to 2030. What's new? Nothing. The fuel is here. The road is paved. Our future beyond the horizon. The journey is bonded by beliefs. Students are our top priority. The whole is greater than the sum. Access and understanding of technological advances are necessary to keep up with 21st century needs. Teachers must have the time and resources to unite the students on the step of their journey. Our goal is to help them find this path. Why 2030? Education advocate Barnett Berry and 12 outstanding teacher leaders co-authored the book Teaching 2030, What We Must Do for Our Students in Our Public Schools, Now and in the Future. This work provided a timeline to execute the transformation. To help move this vision forward, the Arizona K-12 Center launched the Arizona Teacher Solutions Team, an innovative endeavor that brought together 20 teacher leaders committed to imagineering a future for teaching and learning in Arizona. More than 150 educators convened to define the steps necessary to get us there. We must create dynamic and flexible learning environments and find new ways to measure school success. Expand beyond today's brick and mortar buildings and transform our schools into community hubs that support students and their families. 
view teaching as a well compensated profession, ensuring every student has an effective teacher committed to spreading expertise. The path must become a highway where practice meets policy. We have undermined teachers to. Uh, so that's an example of something that I got a little extra help with, with the graphic animation. As you can see that when you can bring those elements to life, uh, there's such a big um, kind of add-on that, that that brings. So, but that's with money. <laughs> and so I think that my message there when it comes to videos or sharing visuals, whether it's through sketch noting or through charting or through visual images or through larger than life uh, graphic recording, is that there is no really kind of wrong or right art when it comes to it. It doesn't have to be the perfect image. It doesn't have to be colored all in the lines. There, there's kind of this uh, vulnerability that comes with imperfection. When people, are, I'm taking back to my third graders. If I had all they'd ever seen in my classroom was my larger than life Minutemen and my 3D habitats, and all they ever saw was my best work, that would limit their thinking and their ability to see themselves as artists themselves. It was when they were able to see the vulnerability of the scratch every time I was up at the board and trying to kind of use it images to help uh, uh, further a concept, that that's where the connection really began. So whether or not it's done just kind of your own little machine, the best you know how, uh, I've gone through got going, I've gone more digital with a lot of my things because I can get things uh, to people more readily. If I do it on paper, I've got to go through a scanner, especially the larger ones. Whereas when I do something digitally, I can, I can really quickly share that with others, let them enhance it, send it back. There's a lot more opportunity for the communication to be tighter and more timely when I go digital. This happened to be a sermon series uh, that we did on uh, different characters in the Bible. Uh, this was a concept that I drew for um, a teacher leadership framework. And then I even started a Twitter campaign about a year ago uh, where I was just taking the ideas of what was out there on Twitter and it launched itself into a hashtag called Rebrand Teaching. It got some negative attention and some positive attention, but in, I think you know that in the Twitter world, negative attention is sometimes a good thing. It gets people talking about why do we need to rebrand teachers. These are all of the submissions that people would, would tweet out saying, yeah, I think we need to rebrand teaching. Teachers are not just uh, teachers, they're change agents, they're nation builders. That one happened to be uh, given by Arnie Duncan himself. Um, and it really kind of culminated in this idea that we can take people's ideas and put them in images and communicate uh, a more strong uh, message as a result. So I kind of close this presentation with the idea that my, my father actually gave me this quote because it's very much how I've lived my life and how I continue to, um, to encourage others. And that is, we can use words until we're blue in the face. And words are powerful communication tools. But words are a lot like lead pencils. We can use them a lot, and the more that we use them and don't use other methods of communication to enhance that, the duller our point becomes. And so I really am excited and encouraged by uh, knowing that visual art is something that is so much not, oh, not only more accepted, both in education and the world, but it really is uh, being served to enhance the message. So Frame the Messaging is um, that opportunity to really think about how do we communicate. This happens to be a blind gentleman. And someone up there, you can see him next to him, is standing next to him explaining what she's seeing. And it was a powerful picture that I had to snap because when we talk about 80 to 85% of people being visual, we also have to recognize that visual messages can and do make an impact on those that may not see themselves or aren't even visual themselves. So I would love to know a little bit more about what you can teach me when it comes to the types of uh, software that can enhance these programs. I, of course, see all kinds of mistakes in everything that I do, but when it comes to opportunity to learn more, uh, I think this is a group that really has a lot to teach me. So I would invite any questions that you might have or even some ideas that as you were watching, hey, Terrell, have you ever seen uh, resources that I might explore, uh, websites I might uh, examine, or even software that you know of that could enhance uh, what I'm trying to do at Frame the Message. So I'll open that up to questions or comments. I really do invite you to share with me great ideas that you have so that I can jot them down and start to grow as a company myself. Questions? Thanks. Uh, I did one presentation for a company that I had a new aerospace. It was on a really complex topic for our flight management system. Uh -huh. People were complaining about like all the PowerPoint slides that other people were going through. Yeah. So I just took one slide that
are some ways to get past that? Um, I've learned to just practice a lot on that type of board. Now, remember, I was a classroom teacher for 18 years, and so writing on a vertical <laughs> surface, I kind of mastered over time, because otherwise I would go down like this. And, so I kind of have learned space. My, what I have learned is when, especially like when you're drawing a line, draw the line with your eye up here first. So like if you're drawing here, rather than thinking about each individual character, that's how you end up going down like this. Imagine the imaginary line at the finish point, and then as you draw, you're keeping that kind of vision in your horizon, and you're aiming towards that line. Does that make sense? Yeah. Same thing when you're drawing the line, is you don't imagine the line itself as much as where you want the line to end up, and you keep that in your visual scope rather than the character. That's, that's something that I can become more aware of. Anyway. I have a question. Yeah. I have a couple questions, actually. So when you... Um, when you're being hired to do this, do they give you notes ahead of time? This is what we're going to be discussing. Do you just like prepare yourself a little bit? Like I'm going to need to know how to draw religious people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny about that is no, they don't. Um, I just listen and draw as they're, they're as they're speaking. However, they have been known to give me notes in the past because I think a lot of people think, oh, there's no way she's going to just be able to draw on the fly. Sometimes they'll tell me kind of the sense of where they're going and where they're going to go next so that they can give me an idea. I have found when they give me their notes, my pastor is one of those, they'll give me pages of his sermon. Well, there is so much in there that there's no way I'm ever going to be able to capture all of that, nor do I want to. If I capture all of it, it defeats the purpose of the big ideas, the themes, and the kinesthetic hooks. So I have found that using that is good for giving me a good sense of it. But if I fixate too much on, oh, and I want to draw this, and I want to draw this, and I want to draw this, I find I never, it never ends up, I, it's not what I end up with. I, I listen, I don't listen as well when I'm so trying to capture every single word. So I've learned to just kind of read it, go, oh, that's nice, give me an idea, and put it aside if they give it to me. For the most part, I don't ask them. I just know what kind of questions to ask to listen for. And then I know how to engage the audience with, you know, so does this capture everything? that you're hearing is the same point and that uh, needs to be heard. So, yeah. All right, I have one more question. So we discussed a little bit beforehand um, how much people pay for the digitized versions of this. Can you talk to the students for that? Oh, yeah, I can talk about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. So um, I found in education that we have a very limited budget. <laughs> and so when I was first introducing this concept to people, I, left, I mean, at the Arizona K-12 Center, they've given me huge amounts of uh, opportunity and they put me in places where I've been able to draw for some really amazing people in education. So like the superstars of my profession, I would say. Um, but what I was finding is that it's very hard to um, express to people why it's important, why they should consider it, and certainly why they should invest in it. Um, in investigating, how many of you have seen those RSA illustrates on YouTube? They're like whiteboard and they draw characters really fast with a black pen It's all and, and it's done with a narrative. Seen those before? So, um, and how many of you have heard of Video Scribe? Yeah. Okay, where, they, where you can actually take your own images or clip art images, and you can embed a hand, and it'll act like it's drawing it. So you can create something like that just by grabbing clip art from the from uh, you know Google Images, really. Um, I have found out. I've been trying to investigate what the cost is of this because as I try to pass the cost on to clients, potential clients. I want to be reasonable because I know they have limited funding, but I also want to be competitive with what's being done out there already. So to do one of those RSA Illustrates, if you were an organization and wanted to, to hire them to do that, you would pay between three to $5,000 a minute for a video. So you're looking at a three to four minute video, right? $15,000 to create three minutes of video. Right, good money in that, right? Well, the difference between that and what a district or a school or a, you know anyone in education is going to pay is astronomical, out of the ballpark of, of realm of possibility. So that's what really inspired me as a new learner is, okay, what can I do that's economical, that is feasible, is within the realm of what people can pay for, but still does the same kind of thing and deliver the same kind of message. And that's where I happen upon the, the keynote and my iMovie, everything that I use in my classroom, I can use. Really what it comes down to is the time that, it's, that it takes to do, as you know, graphic animation, create vectors, all of that kind of stuff takes time. So what you're paying for is all of those extra layers of time. But what I'm finding is, and I'm, I'm really um, looking, and this is where I love ideas for 
do is looking for ideas to make this that kind of professional look and still have it be something that, that people will um, want to invest in, but to do it at an economic price. Is that the direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of blew my mind away. I mean, I know it's expensive because we all know how long we spent just doing our simple little PowerPoints with our little stick figures, you know. Um, this stuff takes time and businesses, they pay for this. You know, they want those little three second, three minute little clips because they don't want it too long or you lose the focus of the viewer. But um, big money clearly takes more than you know, three minutes to make those. But, um, so as any good business person would do, they know what industry to get into, and in case you're probably not it. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when they know what business to get into, but what I'm looking to try to do is take my lack of training and lack of knowledge of, of that kind of higher end technology, but to be able to do something that is of equal caliber or as equivalent caliber, so that I can really get into the market in a way that um, will be affordable, but also be able to create a, a high quality image. That's what I've been chasing and will continue to chase uh, as I develop my LLC. I would just suggest like, hands-on ideas and like, do that that when I mentioned going digital um, I'm a Mac user and I swear by it but I had trouble with um, uh, the stylus and things on a Mac you know because it reads your I don't know what you call that right it reads your every time you put your hand down so talk about getting used to writing on a board getting used to writing on a tablet was a, a curve for me as well because I have to put my hand down to draw so this is a Samsung Note Pro and it comes with a stylus that I can't lose which I like to add to um, but so in, and I use a program called Artflow. And what I like about Artflow is that it um, it has there's a technology that allows certain styluses. You might know what it's called, something like magnetic. You know, uh, reading where it's only going to pick up where my stylus is. It's not going to pick up anything that I do with my hand. Right? That's why I went for Mac. I'm a Mac lover, but I had to have something that allowed me to kind of lay my hand down so that as I was drawing, so that as I was drawing, it didn't get confused by my hand. Right? That's cool. <laughs> so this I, it allows me to kind of keep in, and I can keep and store everything. So what I'm thinking is that I'll be able to use, um, you know, so everything that I've drawn is in here. And I can use this to do the same thing with Photoshop in order to... Now the animation is what I'm really dying to learn how to do. Do you know that I chased that RSA Illustrate idea? How many of you have heard of Draw My Life? Right? They're all over YouTube. Okay, and everybody's doing it differently, right? One of the ways they're doing it is just with basic, with their iPhone. So I set this thing up. 